Welcome to Leading Voices in Healthcare and the third in a series of webinars featuring Jim Bajan. Leading Voices in Healthcare presented by Healthcare Risk Advisors, part of the TDC Group, is where healthcare industry experts share thoughts on the latest trends, data, guidance, and best practices. We're delighted today to present Teaching Quality and Safety to Reduce Patient Harm. We'll get started with our program shortly, but first, just a few housekeeping items. Please note this session will be recorded and the recording can be accessed by logging back into this event on the Socio platform and clicking the videos icon. Also note that by clicking the icons in the left of your screen, you can review the meeting agenda, read full bios on our speakers, search for other attendees and access speaker presentations. We encourage you to use the attendees list to connect and privately chat with each other. Our speakers will each give a brief introduction to the topic, and then most of our program will be a discussion during which we welcome your questions. To submit your questions, please use, please use the chat box on the right-hand side of your screen, and note that the chat box can be seen by all attendees and is intended for the use of questions only. If we're not able to get your question during the event, we'll reach out to you afterwards. Attendance at today's live presentation will also enable viewers to claim CME credit, you can view these instructions for claiming CME credit right on your screen. You can simply scan the QR code or follow the directions on the screen. We will show this again at the end of today's webinar as well. So I'm now pleased to introduce Bridget Shaw, the Associate Dean for Quality Improvement and Patient Safety for Graduate Medical Education and the VP of Medical Affairs for the Mount Sinai Hospital Health System. Bridget. Good afternoon. Thanks, David, for inviting me and looking forward to our conversation with Jim. So uh, good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us. Um, to start off our session, what I thought I would do is briefly provide a little bit of perspective on where the um, educational field related to teaching quality and patient safety has been, and then share with you at the end some educational models that we might want to think about as we, as we start to have a conversation about how to teach um, quality and patient safety to a wide variety of learners. Next slide. So Quality and patient safety as a field of knowledge has really developed over the last 30 years. Um, both content experts and educators have been working diligently to help define what this broad field really entails. You may hear this referred to as health system science um, as, and with quality and safety being part of what is within that field. Um, this schematic is trying to encapsulate for you the big buckets of knowledge, skills, and attitudes um, which this field encompasses. So, you know, in the realm of quality improvement, this is classically going to be things such as your tools, concepts, terms, and models, which we might use in our process improvement work. Um, similarly, in patient safety, there's a body of um, evidence, there's a body of patient safety science and concepts, as well as tools that we use both to understand um, adverse events, as well as figuring out what are our next steps and how do we um, use those. Many of these tools and concepts, as many as, as, as some of you know, come from the um, engineering field, um, and they've been adapted to or, um, or applied within the health, health, health sciences um, to engage in uh, patient safety and quality improvement. Um, in addition, two additional domains, which sometimes get overlooked, but I think are equally important, are um, skills and knowledge in the realm of leadership. Um, particularly as it relates to change management, um, greater emphasis and um, literature on the role of tending to understanding and trying to shape culture as part of the work we do in quality and patient safety. And then the variety of leadership skills that might come in this realm. Here I've listed the, um, the competencies of emotional and social intelligence. I think the way in which we understand ourselves and regulate our behavior, as well as how we relate to others is a critical part of understanding and developing skills that are important in order to do the quality and patient safety work. And then lastly, organizational psychology. I think the field of organizational psychology has a lot to offer to us in this field. And many of the um, thought leaders that have um, produced literature and produced learning materials have really thought about what is the role of the learning environment, which for those of us that um, interface with any phase of medical education or health profession education, think about. And then thinking about how systems operate, they're organized and they're structured in both the micro environment and the macro environment in order to make change, garner resources, and use our tactics of influence to be able to address quality and patient safety, we need to have an understanding of the organization. Next slide. For those of you that are not um, educators, I wanted to just briefly define this idea of competencies. Health professionals education is organized around a set of competencies 
Um, as a profession, we engage in a competency-based model of education, and that is the combination of three things, knowledge, skills, and attitudes, and together that forms a competency. And in the way that most of, um, you know, I'll speak to medical education is organized, um, we have six general competencies. Um, they're used um, definitely at the graduate medical education level and are also used as part of assessment and structuring learning at the um, continuing professional development level. The three competencies that I think are most relevant to this conversation are practice-based learning improvement, which is really the competency about using data, using evidence to improve and adjust our delivery of care. The second is systems-based practice. This is really the whole concept of teaming, understanding that um, healthcare delivery occurs through systems and teams that work together to deliver healthcare. And then lastly, the various facets of interpersonal and communication skills, um, both written and verbal. In this case, the way in which we um, probably engage in a lot of verbal communication and partner with a variety of professions is a critical competency as we do the work in quality and patient safety. Next slide. So in the next couple of slides, I'm gonna share with you a couple of learning models. For those of you that maybe wear more of an educator hat or have come up in your career as a clinician educator, these should be relatively familiar to you. Um, but I like to share these as a foundation on which um, some of the other comments I'm gonna make later on in the session will be anchored. So the first is this idea that adults learn through experience and Kolb um, as an educational um, theorist said that adults learn through this cycle. They have a concrete experience they then go and reflect on this um, experience, either that's a facilitated reflection with the aid of a supervisor um, or they're self-reflecting. Through that reflection, they then have some learning points, right? They're able to say, well, this is what went well, or when I face this problem again, I should really think about doing X, Y, or Z. And then when they're faced with this problem the next time, they're able to take that learning nugget or that piece of knowledge and apply it in that situation. So Culp talks about us learning through this um, cycle. For those of us that practice clinical medicine in any form, this is a lot of how we probably learned or begin to engage first in our clinical environment as we're learning to take care of patients. So that's one model I want us to, to think a little bit about. I think that if you think about that, there are definitely key moments where um, quality and patient safety related concepts and events um, can overlay on this model as a way to inform how we teach and train people in these topics. Next slide. The other key piece is really that we don't learn in a vacuum, right? Um, we learn and we teach in an environment. Um, and that environment interacts with the learners as much as the learners interact on the environment. So there's this interplay. Vygotsky was one of the um, social scientists who really talked about this, both at the K through 12 and at the adult level, um, and really said that there is this interplay between the environment and the learner. And so if we're looking to teach these things, if we're looking to make improvements, or we're looking to think about why do people behave the way that they do, we need to not only look at the person, but we need to think about the environment that they're in. What are the systems? What are the forces? What are the pressures? Um, the other piece is how does the environment um, imprint or influence the learner long-term. And hopefully we'll have a conversation about that a little bit later. Um, and the next slide. So the last sort of educational concept that I wanted to highlight or pull out um, in my introductory comments is the idea or the role of reflection, which is really the key to deeper learning. Um, I will tell you as a learner, I was not really one that was big on reflection. I, I'm reflective of my own practice, but I didn't really buy into it as a learning concept until I started my master's about six years ago. And I have become such a fan of reflection in almost everything I do, um, because I really do think it helps to get at what really underpins behavior and the way in which we think and see the world. So um, this is a schematic that I created after um, an article written by Argus and Schoen. They are um, organizational psychologists who've written about this for, wrote about this in the mid seventies. Um, basically they say that most of we often engage in a task which has a process and the feedback we get tends to be about our actions in that task process loop, right? We tend to tell people what they did right, what they did wrong, here's how they could do it better. What we often fail to do is to dig deeper through some um, facilitated reflection to get at the assumptions, the beliefs, the worldview or prior lived experiences that are probably influencing the way in which people behave and think. And so that's called single and double loop learning, single loop being the top part of the slide, right? We tend to only give feedback in that task process sort of phase. 
And double loop learning is where we dig a little bit deeper to get at those underpinnings to help people really understand why they're doing what they're doing. And hopefully that gives them the insight to make change in behavior. I'm hoping we can come back to some of that in our conversation later on during this webinar. So next slide. So just in conclusion, um, where are we at? Health professional education has come a long way, um, particularly in the last 10 years, to define what, what the quality and safety domains are. Um, there are many educational models to inform our design, and I hope that we can share some ideas around that. And then lastly, questions for us as a group. Are we doing this the best we can with this background? What opportunities might exist for the future? So thank you very much. I'm going to hand it back over to David. Great. Thanks so much, Bridget. I'd like now to welcome Jim Bajan. I think everybody knows Jim is the founding director of the Center for Healthcare Engineering and Patient Safety, as well as the Center for Risk Analysis and Formed Decision Engineering at the University of Michigan. Jim. Thanks a lot, David. Well, uh, I think uh, Dr. Shaw Bridgen gave us a great uh, overview of the kind of things we're going to look at and the, some of the underpinnings of that. And I'm just going to jump off from that and, and talk about how do, how do we see this maybe in every day and how does that affect the goals we're trying to uh, achieve? So uh, next next slide, please. Just to review a little bit, uh, in the first part of this, these, this webinar series, we talked about understanding adverse events. And we talked about a number of things that were really important to this. And I, and I point this out, as Bridget had been talking about just a few moments ago, that everything is related to everything else. In a system, you know, they relate in different ways, the influences of the environment, of people you work with, of the task at hand, uh the, the the component with how that influences the outcome varies day to day it's a dynamic process one of the things we talked about in looking at this whole thing is how do we understand adverse events next next one and you'll see we highlight the um the one thing that i think really comes in here is when we're thinking about teaching is we want to really understand so we're constantly improving and providing the best care to the patient what are the root cause and underlying contributing factors are and how do we get sustainable results next slide the next thing we talked about in this series was how do we engage the C-suite? Because that's part of the of the system, if you will, the, you know, the entire milieu of everything that comes to uh, influence what the outcomes are. And we talked everything about the roles of the C-suite and the board, uh, various organizational structures, culture and the culture of ownership about who's responsible, like being, I would say, anti-silo, that people have to understand that's part of the system's approach that when we view individually that our task is we have to do this task and we ignore how that impacts others or other impact us, then we're not going to really get the good job. The job is not for us to do the task. The, the job is to achieve the overall goal. So that's a big deal in the difference between responsibility and accountability. Next slide. And what really comes back to the goal, right? It's always what are we trying to achieve? And I would say that when we're talking about safety and quality, that we really want to make sure no patient will be inadvertently harmed while under our care. So everything we do, we should be able to trace back to do we achieve this goal or not? Next slide. So what are some of the barriers? Well, our objective here, right, is to, in this one, in this conf, in the uh, webinar today, is, you know, how do we effectively teach trainees, staff, faculty, et cetera, so that, you know, they continuous to produce the optimum level of safety and quality, right? Now, one of the things going back when we started CLEAR with the ACGME over a decade ago, uh, at one of the big educational conferences with ACGME, one of the DIOs got up and said, I feel like an imposter. You know, so here they are, they're in charge of the teaching program at their institution. And they said, as far as quality safety goes, I'm an imposter. And I think that was really a, an interesting way to, to uh, term that. Next, please. So what are some of the barriers? The first is that if we have the people who are doing the teaching lack the training and real experience, so it's not just didactic training, it's not just reading a book, have they really gotten the experiential part? And I think the, the cold, model that uh Brendan showed is is a good concept to look at i think it's kind of we can think about another way how do we always do business like that we learn by experience we hope we do so if people are trying to teach things that they never done that wouldn't work we wouldn't think about teaching somebody how to be a cardiologist and have them you know look at harrison's or something and then be done and say oh you've read you know you've read the book now you don't need to uh, actually see a patient you're ready to practice we would never do that and the same thing goes for quality and safety so then you get the organization. Does the organization walk the talk? We see a lot of lip service about where, you know, quality is important, care of the patient's important. But if they're really, you know, really don't back that up, you know, where it really reinforces what we do and that the word culture was used earlier and culture is a dependent variable. 
It's a description of how the organization operates, sort of like when nobody's looking. Uh, that's what the culture is. So if you don't lead by example, you as an individual and the organization is just a collection of individuals, if their behavior doesn't do that, it won't get you there. So then does the organization show that their safety and quality is important? And we see many times people talk about when they're working with these things, this isn't looked at as their real job. Their real job is to generate RVUs or whatever. But then when there's a quality issue or safety issue, they're supposed to do that in their spare time. That's terrible leadership. And the really good organizations don't do that. Um, and, and that's one of the things that's a, an obstacle we need to deal with. Uh, another indicator that these things are not being done well is when you see known problems recur, recommendations that actually have come out before through various analyses are never implemented. And there's no transparency between the impact of what we're doing and how our processes work or don't work well and what it does to the patient. And we don't report that uniformly both inside to the people that are working as well as to the patients and the public. And when you don't do that, that's really a recipe for disaster. Next slide, please. So what do we try to do? So training and education, you know, most uh, both teaching and training being theoretical and apply. And this goes back just, you know, going back to the, the slide Bridget showed that it's not enough just to talk about it. People have to actually apply it. And there's another theory talk about state dependent learning. And they're not talking about state like New York or New Jersey. They're saying the environment in which the learning takes place has to most closely approximate the real world so that little cues that you might not have uh, explicitly think about, but actually do prompt you to react or, or act or think in certain ways have to be there. So people have high fidelity stimulation and things of that nature. So the more you closely replicate the real world, the more likely the training is going to be used. This also makes the point that the closer you get to actual, the practice-based learning was talked about, the better off you are. So trainers have to have at least as much theoretical understanding as the trainees. You know, they're and they're expected to acquire that and have to actually have practical applied experience. We see again and again that we'll have uh, some of our, many of our faculty have never actually applied these concepts, have never done them and shown that they can actually produce beneficial advances for the for their institution and mainly for the patients. So this is kind of a this imposter thing. The, the fact that we want people to teach about it, but they've never ever been trained where they actually had guided practice to implement these various skills and techniques and see how they work. So that's an important thing to do in a barrier. Uh, resources, I talked about it on a previous slide, is especially time. If we don't let the people who we want to both teach and perform these skills and learn them have adequate time to do it so that it is a priority. If we don't do that, then it's telling everybody it really isn't. So we shouldn't be surprised when we see, as we've seen in the clear reviews now for a decade, that there's been very little improvement in the last 10 years at all. There's been a lot of effort put in, but because it's done as a second fiddle type thing, we really, the, the quantitative results are pretty discouraging. Uh, next. And, and this comes back a little bit to transparency. If there's transparent communication, communication at all levels about what the challenges are, about how we're going to deal with them, about prioritizing things correctly, and actually risk-based decisions that say we'll accept certain uh, outcomes or not, just because there maybe aren't enough resources, there aren't enough hours in the day uh, for us to take care of the patients. We decide what the best way to take care of the patients are and then don't do everything. But it's kind of a sham if we act, if we try to charge uh, people to do these things in training, we think they can do it all and really don't give them the time. Then we force them to ad hoc decide what to do without a real good way to prioritize it. And we can get some unintended uh, poor results. Uh, next slide. So the bottom line is this. You know, the official priorities we have when we're training somebody and both for the people that are providing the training and the ones we're training have to be aligned with our real priorities. And this means that we have to allow appropriate time and actually allow time and other resources to accomplish the next. Um, what's taught has to be observable in everyday operations. It's not good for it to be viewed as do as I say, not as I do. And we see this many times where there'll be various policies We'll give training, whether it's the faculty, others talk about how we should do it. But then when when people watch them, that isn't what they do every day. Next. So we have to realize that, you know, we have to role model what is taught. I mean, we all are role models, whether we think about that or not. People watch what we do at whatever level, whether they're a trainee or we're the head of a department. People see what we do and we're what we're showing them by what we do is what we truly believe. So otherwise, you know, and that ends up making us look Hippocratic if we don't really do 
what we say we're going to do and model that. So we're all role models. Next, you know, we have to think what we're doing, this kind of goes to the cold thing, that we know what is the attainment of the goal? What is the goal we're trying to attain? That takes action. If all we do is talk about it, either at the individual level or at the, the more administrative management level, and we don't take action and then assess those actions, show they're successful or not, and then go through this cycle again, then this whole thing's a sham. And we make sure we do that in a transparent way. If we are not always successful, that might be the case. We look at that. There's no there's no shame in failing. There's shame in not trying to get better and recognize and admit where the problems where we've fallen short. And finally, you know, the organization has to walk the talk. And we've said this earlier that we you know it's easy to say what we should do. There's plenty of things written about what we should do. The question is, do we do it every day? And if we don't, then the chance of really being successful in training people and get them to really adopt it and use it in their everyday practice is pretty remote. So, I, you know, with that, I think it's time to go to the conversation. So over to you, David. Great. Thanks so much, Jim. So now we've heard some uh, some brief introductory remarks from our two experts. Let's uh, start talking about the details, right? Um, and where else to start but at the beginning? Uh, we're talking about uh, teaching in its broadest sense. Um, and we're, we're, we start with students, right? Uh, students and residents involved in patient safety while they're still in school and, and in training. Tell us a little bit about your thoughts on that and the importance of that. And I have a little bit of an ulterior motive here. I'm giving a talk to a group of medical students next week, so I need some tips. Help me out here, guys. So first of all, I think it's, it's incredibly important. I mean, why? Well, like anything that you learn that's new, right? If you learn it from someone who understands the value of how to deliver safe and high quality care as you're doing whatever you're doing, right? Whether that's washing your hands and introducing yourself when you meet a patient to take a history, or it's understanding the quality measures when you're taking care of a patient with diabetes or heart failure. If you learn that early, then that just becomes part of your thinking, becomes part of the way in which you respond to data and you behave and deliver the care. So I think that's, that's from the very, very beginning. I also think teaching about it, talking about it, understanding sort of the harm that the healthcare system can contribute to people um, and how this is a public health issue. If you learn about it early on, then it doesn't become an add-on or at least it helps to fight some of that, you know, second, third job that Jim was just mentioning in his introductory comments. So to getting to it as a core value from the very beginning, right? Jim, thoughts? Right. And I, I totally agree. And I think part of the thing that, you know, just to hit it again is that I think it's, I can tell you from my own observations on CLEAR and others that while, you know, I'm sure it's not the case with Bridget, for example, but I can say many places that people that are tasked with doing the training really have never had it themselves. And, and they're really like maybe a half a page ahead of the students, maybe about reading about it. And, and when the, when the, when the uh, students see this, they get that. They're not stupid. And they go, wow, you know, my, my faculty member doesn't model in what they do every day. In their behavior and even when they're telling me in a didactic way they don't understand what they're talking about so that even that unconsciously communicates this is an important you know if you're a trainee you think about there's a million things you're trying to learn to learn your craft to learn what's going to go on and that's certainly a daunting task for all of us i think and then if we want this to be a baseline thing and yet we see oh here are my faculty and they're not even doing it or they're doing the opposite they go well i guess this is important why would i waste time and i think this is hugely important, and, and I know we've done stuff where when we first rolled this out at some of the institutions I've been out, we when we started, we made all the faculty that we're going to teach us have to go through with the students the first time. And we said, you know what? We understand how to do this. We set these programs. You're going to be a student with them, just like them. Go through, and it's like almost like a see one, do one, teach one. And then the next time, we're going to mentor you. You teach it, and we'll be sitting there. And if you really go way off the rails, we might – say, oh, I think what the, the faculty member meant to say was this and go through. And then the third time we did it, we virtually said nothing, let them do it. And after that, they just did it. And then we just QA it now and then. By doing that, we saw we really got sustainable, good results. But without it, some were good and some were just terribly bad and people were getting the whole wrong impression. And yeah. like we filled the square of giving the instruction and really it was better if we did nothing at all. Yeah, you know, uh, I love your, uh, your talk, Jim, about walking the walk, and it reminds me of this classic thing. Look, uh, learning healthcare is still very much an apprenticeship in many ways, and the, the story of the attending walking into the patient's room, and if they wash, if they, you know, if they do the Purell thing, 
uh, the, the little ducks behind them do the same thing. And if they don't, the little ducks behind them don't, right? I mean, it's, it's unbelievable how that, that's still the case, right? It's still the case. So given all this, and both of you, by the way, I think our audience knows, both of you are deeply involved in education, the ACGME and so forth. How much of this is really happening now in schools? Both of you are at schools. You, you have a sense for what goes on elsewhere. Are we teaching safety and quality at, at, at currently in schools, both medical schools, nursing schools, healthcare professional schools? It's a great question. So, um, and, and admittedly, my comments are a little bit biased because I teach in an MD program. However, I've spent time sort of learning what do PAs do. I teach in a PA program. I teach this content there, and I've learned a little bit about what the nursing um, profession and pharmacy learns. So, we are seeing an inclusion of these competencies, this knowledge, into the curriculum. So, it is there now. How, how much it winds up becoming an item that's quote unquote tested, I think is variable. I mean, and it's still gonna be a small percentage of what is there. I mentioned the testing because we do know, good or bad, that if you put something on a test, people are at least more likely to pay attention to it, give it the curricular time and make sure it's taught. Um, I do see in more and more MD programs, at least, a greater inclusion and curricular time on this and some really cool innovative models of how to teach and do this. Um, if you go into MedEd Portal, which is an online journal for you know, medical educators, you see lots and lots of um, resources that people have developed using a variety of techniques to teach this content. Um, you know, um, I think that one of the challenges is we're still at a place where much of this is living in the classroom. And the Jim's comments and points, they're not connecting it with what's happening in the reality or what's being taught in the classroom is so different from what their reality is when they step out onto the wards or in the clinic. Yeah, I would echo, echo what Bridget said. I think we had actually just, we were talking about this this morning with uh, a thing we're running in one, I won't say which especially one of the, in, you know, getting interns and put them through. And we have you know interns from our own facility as well as from other facilities and you see the difference in background is striking uh there's some that really have had a lot of experience and and are really on the ball sometimes more than some of the faculty they're doing it and then we have others that it's like it's a new subject in fact we have to tell them oh you know there's a silent e in the word safety i mean that's like a big news flash so uh and that's sometimes for some of the faculty as well so I think this the standardization, I can tell you over the last decade, I think the people coming out of the, of the actual training, you know, entering their first, you know, post-clinical training year have way more than before. I think the, the percentage of faculty that are really uh, up to speed and actually done anything is improved somewhat, but not to the same degree as the students, which I, I'll tell you creates a real issue because we have a more sophisticated early trainee experience base. And now when they see the dinosaurs, when they come out, they know they're dinosaurs, which becomes a huge issue. And, yeah. and we're trying to deal with that. And, and there's, and it's really, unfortunately in academic centers, I think are the worst, quite frankly, yeah. you know, the departments each are in their own little silo and some really have done a good job and their faculty are outstanding. And there's others. It's like, they can't be bothered. And this is like a real leadership challenge that I think, different organizations struggle at different levels, but it's one that's very commonly seen. Yeah, a comment from one of our, our listeners, I think is, is really spot on about the incentives for faculty, right? It's all about traditional scholarship. Um, where does quality and safety fit into that? Because uh, that's, you know, it's uh, published or perish. Is that still the case? Probably. But are you, do you get credit for publishing safety and quality things or not? I don't know. Well, well look, there's a pet peeve. We were just talking about this the other day about even some of the you know, publications, you know, and I won't mention who they are. And you'll see things that I would tell you from, you know, it's like with peer review. Sometimes articles sent to peer reviewers, the people reviewing don't know, know very little about the subject. And you'll get one review back says, wow, this is great. And it's demonstrated. And another one says, well, I really don't think that's really a, an adequate academic treatment. And I'm going like, give me a stinking break. You know, we're talking about people that have actually shown, for instance, with trainees, went from there was one survey they went and surveyed people five years later actually practicing you know went back now imagine if you're you're out of your residency five years and says ask you like nine questions what did you do about this how did you do this and people are writing back everybody the majority said i found this really valuable the majority said i use this every day it really equipped me to pr private practice and the response one of the things why does that even matter it comes from a reviewer and the editor says we don't think this is really suitable for publication i'm going like so what is we're going to do some other academic study that nobody can apply that just shows no success i mean 
this is the kind of thing this is related to the incentive of, of the faculty they go i'm getting mixed messages here yeah yeah I, I, think, I think that um i still think that um you know for some people it is about the publications and the grants i think for others it's in the majority of folks it's about the clinical volume and that's the that's uh, the real struggle yeah. and um yeah. unfortunately our metrics to help people to get insight into the quality and safety of their care at the provider level, depending on the specialty, aren't that great, um, right? The attribution of how much can I say that your length of stay is about you? It's a team right. sport, right? Like how much did you pin it on the provider? So I think that's where we really struggle, I think, across all of healthcare, um, if we're gonna use sort of the payment piece as a as a, a model to, 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 to guide behavior change. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, and jumping on that, you know, we talked about this, I think, in one of the previous webinars a little bit, and I think it does come in here in a, in a, in a, in a live, live way, and that is the business case, right? If you look at it that way. Yep. I think, you know, and, and I look more for the faculty do it than the students or the trainees, but they could too. When you show, wow, if I did this, and, you know, and if you look at your historically, we had this many, let's take ophthalmology, which is one of the major ones that has problems with putting the wrong lenses in and stuff. So what does that cost us? What does that cost us in wasted care? What does that cost us in non-payment? What does this cost us reputationally? What does this cost us in malpractice claims? And oh, if we did something that shows we don't have those anymore, that's the real thing. And oh, by the way, we're supposed to be taking care of the patient, duh. You know, if you lay some of that out and show that, then people start, you know, that are counting RVUs or whatever, they go, wow, I never even thought about that. And if you bother to connect those dots, suddenly you have people like the CFO involved, you get the CEO involved because they don't want to be ambushed, interviewed while they're getting in their car by a reporter and says, is it true that you had this child die because you, you ended up putting do a thoracostomy on the wrong side? And those happen. That's that's the most frequent cause of death by procedure outside the OR. I mean, you don't have to have a bunch of those that'll motivate people. So there's a lot of ways to tell your story to internal and external audience to do that. And I don't think even in some of our training, I think we don't train our faculty to think about how to push back that way because it is a system, right? There's many yeah, things. Yeah. It's not that we have to say th there's no cost too much to make things safe. That is not true. Yeah. You know? it's, it, it's still a challenge for those of us in safety and quality to make the business case, right? It just, I mean, getting the CFO's attention to do this is, it's a nightmare. I don't want to get too off topic. I want to stick to teaching safety. So let's, let's switch gears just a little bit. Um, you talked a little bit about uh, matching, both of you talked about matching what actually happens in real life and what happens in the teaching environment, right? Well, compared to like when I went to medical school, there are so many more tools. So what are we doing to change the traditional way we teach uh, to make it more like real life, right? Uh, simulation, so forth. What are your thoughts about that? So I think there's been a lot about simulation and Jim mentioned high fidelity simulation. I think if you look in both the papers and the education resources out there, there's a lot of people out there doing really, really good quality simulation. And, and the beauty of simulation is, right, you can repeat things, you can bring people in, you can have learners from a variety of professions if you're fortunate to have those close or in your environment to be able to do all of that. I think the other technique, both to be used in simulation and more importantly, when you're taking care of patients is training people to feel comfortable at reflection. So I know that some of this gets kind of covered in some of the team steps work, but how do you facilitate a debrief, right? How do you bring a team together to talk about what happened? What went well? What could we have done better? Was there a different way to communicate? Um, and I think um, helping our educators in their roles as clinicians to do this um, can help to do what's on that slide that I showed, which was getting to a little bit of the prior experiences that might be influencing the way you respond, thinking about your worldviews and your assumptions, right? Especially like I think about it, even in GME, while people have not been practicing as a clinician for that long, it still is amazing to me that when you debrief something, how somebody will be like, well, I had somebody in med school on my sub eye tell me that for this kind of patient, you always need to do that, right? It's breaking all that dogmatism that may not be founded in evidence. And if we don't have time for those kind of conversations, we're, we're getting a little bit stuck. And I think trying to train our, you know, senior residents and fellows to do this is really important. So that's been something we've been trying to do, you know, as we're doing some of our quality and safety sort of faculty development, um, because I think we know the value of debriefing and reflection in general. And then if we can do this as a way to foster more learning, I mean, debriefing is basically learning, um, we might be able to make an impact. Yeah. Some say that's the most important tool in all team, team steps, right? Crew resource management. Jim? Well, I think that's right. And, and I think, you know, 
you know, you, the example you gave a little bit ago, David, is one, you know, you've heard and given many times about, you know, how do you, you know, communication, right? We're talking about communication. How do we learn? It's through communication of many types. And the fact is that in any high, highly competitive environment, certainly healthcare is much like this, you know, people pimp each other about, you know, like they want to show that they're smarter than the other guy. I mean, I think we've all seen that. And if the leadership, that is the, you know, the the person whose service you're on, right, the faculty member tries to dispel that, right? That this is like everybody makes mistakes. We don't want to make mistakes, but to think everybody's perfect's not right. I mean, you know, I can remember as a young astronaut, you know, there was a thing that somebody did was really seemed like a boneheaded thing, and somebody leaned over and said, Is this guy a moron? And one of the senior astronauts sitting in front turned around and said, Well, there's those that have and those that do that, that will. You know, and the point is, no matter how smart you are, it can happen to you. And all you're showing is your inexperience and naivete to think that even what seems to be the most preposterous thing that could happen couldn't happen to you because you didn't know the environment in which it occurred. And to your point, David, I think to break down some of those barriers, like like people are often worried if I display to the attending that I was that I don't know the answer, I couldn't make the diagnosis, I didn't know what the proper way to do it then that's going to affect me negatively in the future. So better to keep my mouth shut or nod my head as if I know, yeah. you know, and fake my way through instead of saying, hey, the only crime is not admitting what you don't know and getting better. That's the crime. Yeah. Being ignorant isn't the main thing, not admitting it. And the, the, the example David gave, I think you were talking about that I used to have people do is when you're on rounds, right off the bat, tell everybody, I'm going to make mistakes on purpose while we're on rounds. And I'd like you to point those out. Yeah. Well, then they don't know which ones you made on purpose or not, right? But work, walking in and not, you know, gelling your hands. Yeah. Does nobody say anything? And you turn to the rest of the crowd and say, are you going to let me touch this patient? Did nobody notice I didn't do that? Why aren't you helping me? Yeah. You know, and if you do it in the right way, it becomes like a kind of fun kind of game. But then, one, if you're the if you're the train, trainer, you know, the faculty, you can say, wow, you know, any mistake you make that they point out and say, I'm glad you caught it. Whether they caught it or whether you knew it or not. I'm yeah. not saying you for that reason, but that's something to humanize. And we've done that a lot. And it really breaks down the barriers and kind of teaches by example that you're not forever branded as being in combat because you asked the question or didn't know. Yeah. You're, you're, Jim, you're taking this principle that we always talk about in safety, all right, around the ability to speak up. And now you're putting it into the educational sphere because you got to, you really have to start there. Um, it's kind of interesting. Bridget and I are going to be at a conference right after this talking about. M&Ms and, you know, the whole thing with the attending and that, I mean, that's got to change, right? It really has to change. And I'm just teeing up the audience here, Bridget, you and I will talk about this like later. Uh, so <laughs> let's, let's go a little bit to a little bit different. You know, we, we you've all mentioned about, um, about working in teams, about healthcare being a team sport. Um, almost every event that we see, even in the malpractice world, we look at events, there's so much about how the team works together. How are we doing at teaching people to work in teams from day one, right? How much how much education when we're in med school do we get with nursing students, with PA students? That's gonna be the reality, not being in a vacuum with just other doctors, right? So how are we doing with cross, you know, cross disciplinary teaching? I think it depends on where you are. Um, uh, I think there are institutions which have really wholeheartedly embraced this concept of health professions education. So they really bring everybody into the fold and they intentionally, have redesigned the way in which they deliver instruction and they think about um, opportunities like simulation and problem-based learning to really involve multiple perspectives. Um, unfortunately, I don't think, at least speaking from the physician education perspective, that's the majority of schools. I think there are a lot of reasons why that are, and I, we don't really have to sort of go into all of that, but I think that we're getting better. I really commend a lot of the work that's gone on some through professional societies, some through groups like the ACGME and AAMC to really do interprofessional education and to get people together. You know, there's a lot of competencies around creating an interprofessional educational program. Um, and it's wonderful when you see it work. Um, that said, um, I think that sometimes we get in our own way. So in some of the healthcare organizations, the work of quality and safety is siloed, right? So you've got physicians doing their quality and safety work, and you have nursing, for example, doing their quality and safety work. Instead of sort of saying, we're doing quality work together and we populate that work group with people with a variety of perspectives. So um, I see Jim nodding, so I'm gonna let him take it off from uh, what, I, what I just said. Well, I think that's, I mean, the, the, 
all everything you said i agree with and the last point is really it how often do we see and and you can do this at many different levels i look at like a fractal you have oh here's a problem that uh, you know surgery had so we tell surgery the place had the problem you do a little analysis and figure out what's going on how stupid is that you know to act like the surgeons operating by themselves were influenced from no one else not from anesthesia not from nursing not from anybody you know so we do that we don't talk to the nurses instead of saying this is a problem we want to have expertise from different areas because they bring different things but we want everybody i mean we used to when i used to run the va system we would we would never do it by department never that's absolutely never it was never allowed that way we'd say here is an adverse event we never use the word error either because that implies a person it was like a foolish term we'd say here is an adverse event or a close call of one so we probably want to have a physician on there we probably want to have at least a nurse and a pharmacist and then we want somebody that has nothing to do with things clinically somebody from the billing office somebody from security because they're looking at the world differently and you would be surprised what you get out of that if they needed to get subject matter expertise of the the guy that was a neurosurgeon go talk to them what you want people there are people to have an open mind have some background and can talk the language of various groups you'll talk to but that's what you need you're not trying to have the world's expert come in that's not necessary in fact it's probably undesirable so yeah. when you see places that that say oh we're going to have pharmacy figure this out we're going to have nursing figure this out that is the most foolish shows such a, an ignorance about how to do system solutions that i can imagine and yet it's more the rule than the exception i would say yeah you know a number of years ago um when we were doing a lot of work in team training right teaching teams and we we realized we need a cross-functional team now we did it by department or you know by area because that made more sense you, you can't really teach teams teamwork to ob folks the same way you do to surgeons or to pediatricians right partly because you have to teach them in a way that they understand you need examples that are relevant to them uh, but it's still it's still cross-functional and i think if you don't do that now it's interesting there were some articles i remember way back when you probably remember too jim in the, in the team training literature about a place that did this they trained the surgeons separately from the nurses they still got pretty good results but i looked at it and thinking this can't work very well without having all the folks there together it just it's antithetical to to practice actual practice right so it seemed kind of artificial even though the results seem to be good um so a little bit a, a little bit of a change of gears here this is one of my one of my favorite questions right oh david so, can you speak yeah, no one please Jim, one, Bridget, one, other, one, other, one other teaching technique that i think can be helpful in this cross team this cross or interprofessional situation right. is how can we help people take perspectives of those that do roles that support the work we do? So, you know, our geriatrics fellowship, um, sorry, our geriatrics rotation with the medical students years ago, medical students used to spend half a day with the medical assistant and like literally following the medical assistant around to understand their role. Um, and I think being able to figure out how do we hear and see the perspective of others, um, either if we're proactively kind of doing process improvement work or when we're trying to hear about how things went in a near miss, or an adverse event, I think can really be a valuable way in which people can gain more understanding of, 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 our, of our fellow team members and then hopefully come to better or more creative solutions. Yeah. I just wanna jump on what Bridget said. I can't emphasize that enough. I mean, I can remember just myself when I was, a, I was in a rotating general surgery internship when I came out and I made sure that I went and learned how to be a lab tech, how to be an x-ray tech and shoot films, you know, do shifts as nurses. I did that when, and I was on every other night in my first year, but I did that. Why? Because I wanted to understand what they do. One, so I understood what were their general capabilities. So was I underutilizing? There were things, talents they had that I didn't know. Are there things they could teach me so I could communicate with them effectively? And so they would understand me. And I think by this part of the communication, you know, if you look at this, I don't mean this in a bad way. We are all just tools in the healthcare system to deliver good care to the patient. And the good mechanic understands how the various tools work and when when to use a screwdriver, when to use a chisel, yeah. when to use a hammer and when not. And it's just like, when it, should it be a, a physician that does it? When should it be a nurse? They bring different talents, different you know, yeah. you know, know, social skills, different knowledge sets. And to just think you know without ever actually spending some time to watch what they do and see it through their eyes, you're not communicating with them as effectively and using them as a real team member the way you could. And I think- yeah. People, and it doesn't take a lot of time. I mean, if you think of all the time you train as a resident, if you spent, say you spent 10 days with 10 different stripes of perfection where you spent the whole day just with them. Yeah. 
in a standard order training, it doesn't even count. Would it give you like an infinite percentage more experience about what nurses do, what pharmacy does, how drugs, drug prescriptions are filled, how the pharmacy? Wow, that might tell you a lot. And we don't do that in any studied way. At most training imagine, days. imagine as a medical student where you'd have a rotation where you're a nurse for a day or a pharmacist for a day, right? Yeah. And really understand as a student, you don't have ultimate responsibility anyway. So you're just there to really experience what the role is like so that when you actually go out into practice, as you said, Jim, I think it's incredibly valuable. So look, um, some have said that you can't teach an old dog new tricks, right? So we're talking about, uh, you know, teaching safety and quality in the entire spectrum. So is there hope that you can teach clinicians uh, in the greatest generation, shall we say, baby boomers like me about safety and quality? How do we do that? Can you teach an old dog new tricks? It's critical. I'm a perpetually optimistic person. So I would like to say yes. <laughs> what did you say? I said, I'm, a perpetually opt I'm an optimist, so I would okay. like to say yes. Um, that said, um, I think there's a couple of things. I think a little bit of it is the approach, right? So I think generationally, I think people are probably used to in that generation being told what to do or some, an edict yeah. coming down from on high, generally by a non-clinician and being like, you have to do this, right? So I think with everyone explaining the rationale, but more importantly, if we can do quality and safety with people, not to people, I think we're likely to have more buy-in. That said, there's still going to be some people that are like, I've been doing this for 25 years. My patients love me. Like, yeah. leave me alone. Leave me alone. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I think at that point, it's thinking about, you know, some of those leadership points that Jim was making. Like, what is the culture? What is the leadership? Do we have buy-in from the very top that it's the same standard for everybody? And how are we going to hold people accountable? Um I think that's going to be the only way to, to sort of help make some behavior change. But Jim, I'm curious what your thoughts are on that topic, since we are of two different generations. <laughs> yeah, or maybe more than that. No, I, I agree with you. I, I mean, we, I, we went through this back in 99 when I first started, you know, doing the stuff at the VA. And I said, you know, what we had to worry about is our, as we're training our trainees, right? That if we're telling them, here's the way the world is and people are going to look for root cause contributing factors, and then they get out there with the dinosaurs and they get eaten their first day on the floor. Nobody's going to believe us. They said, you told me, oh, I should be asking my attending why. And what's before? And he says, hey, this is what I told you to do. Shut up and do it. Not a good thing, right? So we had to run interference. We had to and, and actually meet them where they are, understand what it is, and then actually be in a non-accusatory way. And we wouldn't like uh, identify, hey, here's somebody acting like a horse's ass. We'd say, well, now this approach, look at the bad outcome we had because they didn't do this, they didn't do that, and there's reasons for that, and this is what we do. Now, the person who did, who was the who's the Dewey there, they knew who they were. We didn't put a big red H on their forehead, but they knew it, and we would try to take, bring them along occasionally, and I think it was very, very rare that you'd have somebody say, get lost, I'm going to do it my own way. I mean, that wouldn't happen. You would find over a very short period of time, and I'm talking like less than months, that you would just – keep not to the person what happened to the patient why did it happen how do we make it better and continue to show that and most would get it and then you get to the point eventually that the few that didn't want to get it because now like over 85 percent of the people were doing it then just from peer pressure if you want to look at it that way they couldn't stand up and say ridiculous things because everybody's looking at them even a lot of their own contemporaries are going come on man get over it you know and and you would get there and you could do this really fairly quickly. And an, an example I would give is we always roll out everything with volunteers first, because if a volunteer could do it, the people, the naysayers, like the old dinosaurs are saying can't be done. You've just proven it's being done. So they got to just shut up. You don't have to say this guy's out of his mind. You've proved it. Many people don't want to do it because it might be like the flavor of the day. They think nobody's really going to make this go more than a month. So why should I change? Now you show it has staying power. They go, it's not that I didn't want to do it. I don't want to waste my time. This isn't a waste of time. And we would find virtually anything we did across all our 185 hospitals from the time we identified the, the cause to what we we're going to do to pilot it first with the volunteers, then some others. In less than nine months, we would have it done everywhere with virtually everybody doing it all the time before we even made it a requirement. And in the beginning, it was like, you have to go slow to do fast. They wanted to say, send a memo out to more, everybody do it. And I said to the sector, I said, we can do that. And you'll be able to tell people we sent a memo out. But if you look at what our performance is, that's not going to happen. Let's go a little more slowly, win people over, and you'll find in nine months, we'll actually be doing it. Not like we've sent out a memo and yet nothing's being done. 
Yeah. And I and we did that again and again and again. And it was communicating with people, talking to them, going out and go to the field, actually see them. Don't call them, talk to you, tell them talk to you. I would go to their floor. I go to their department meeting to tell them this is why it is and ask them why it doesn't work. Because often, and I would often say, go to your naysayers first. They'll tell you your baby's ugly. Don't go to your friends. Your friends don't tell your baby's ugly. The other people say, <laughs> oh, what did you get? A new pet? That's a neat dog. You know, what's its name? And you say, no, that's my kid. If you do that, sometimes they're telling you stuff that your friends won't tell you, but they should. And you learn from that. And if you do that, you can really win people over. But it takes effort. It takes a yeah. personal and, and part part of this is understanding human psychology, right? I, yeah. I'm a, I, I used to read a lot of stuff from Vital Smarts. They have an influencer model, right? And everybody's influenced in different ways along, you know, two different pathways. Some of it's can they do it? Do they have the ability to do it? Some of it is are they motivated to do it? And then you've got personal levels where people are influenced by stories and peer pressure, which you, you said, right? They watch other people doing it. And then some of it's just the way the system is built and some of it's carrots and sticks. Some of it makes it easy for people. So I think all of those things together are important. Um, we're getting close to the top of our, I want to talk a little bit about technology and the role of technology. And we mean, we talked a little bit about simulation, but now this is 2022, right? I, I've worked with some of our hospitals on virtual reality tools to teach ACLS, right? Because all of a sudden, three years ago, we had all sorts of people that had to learn how to do this very quickly. Augmented reality. Are you all starting to see some of that become useful in teaching safety and quality across different areas? I am. I mean, I think for the institutions or the the systems that have the resources for that, um, you do see people using it. I can just say from personal experience, I did my last ACLS recertification, sort of doing a hybrid of a very interactive web-based module combined with um, a skills trainer that I could go and do right. on my own and the and the machine would give me a lot of feedback. It was amazing. Like it was way better than any other ACLS go around that I've had in the past. Yeah, um, sure. And it combined all the right things of like making it work, right? They use technology and data to tell me how I was doing on questions, which questions I was getting wrong, showing how I'm doing compared to others, and then giving <coughs> me feedback using haptics. I, I mean, if we can do more of that, um, I think it's really, really neat. The other piece related to technology that I think is a little bit of, you know, I think we're still trying to learn, but how do we help, especially young learners, like figure out how do you use the volumes of data that they have access to? I mean, in some ways, I think back to when I was a, a third year med student and a sub I, where we got paper charts and you didn't get very much. And so you had what you had and that was kind of it. The art of figuring out how to use the EMR and all the data that's there as a piece of technology in delivering safe and high quality care, I think is another aspect that we need to figure out yeah. um, how we deal with this. Yeah, that's a challenge, Jim. Well, technology. I think, you know, I think it varies, right? I think there's some things where simulation can do a good job and it depends on how much you understand. I think some of the ones we're given, like in some of the ACLS and things like that are really good. And, you know, wh why do you simulate? You simulate because you can duplicate things that are too hazardous to do in the real world. You can do whatever you want. It's safe for everybody and it's less costly than doing it in the real world. That's why you simulate, whether it's in healthcare or in aviation. The big thing is how well does your simulator represent the real world? And that's always yeah. the issue. And how's the transfer of training? I think it is useful. I think it's not, should you do it? It's not, but it's not, you should, but it's not the only thing. I think some of the things as you talked about a moment ago, David, it's the people skills. How do you manage some of these things that I haven't seen any simulation that really does that so well. And, and I think when you look at, for instance, when you go to do an actual event analysis and an action plan and all that, there are tools out there and there are things out there and I won't, I won't blow the horn of the one that PDC put out, but is the one I think is the best because I'm prejudiced. But, but, and it's been proven, I think, more than any other. But when you have a methodology and you have people do it, and then it actually is implemented, right? Not you said, oh, this is what we do, but they actually see it work and you learn what it takes them and it works. That motivates people. They say, you know, we've all seen as clinicians stuff that we said, man, why did that have to be done that way? We've all seen that. You know, and when we take out of like one of my litmus tests, when people say they won't let us do it, I go, so is, is there their email address is they at Mount Sinai.org? I mean, who the heck is they? Look in the freaking mirror, you know, that when we get them to stop doing that and say, hey, this is the patient we're responsible for. How would I make it better? How do I learn and learn how to skin the cat? And it's not easy to do and it varies. And that's where if you whet their appetite early on with someone's like that, man they're believers 
I mean, they want they want to they really want to go do it. And that's where with appropriate mentoring in con in concert with simulation, you can do it. And I would tell you, we studied it for literally tens and tens of thousands of event analysis and action plans. And on the average for a, a five to six person team, never more than six, you know, four to five is a sweet spot doing a full analysis in how many man hours, staff hours it takes. It's about 45 to 55 hours to do the whole thing over six weeks. That's like an hour or an hour and a half a week. This is not some unbelievable crushing yeah. burden. Yeah. Right. Properly done, you can do really good work where they see it. And, and I can tell you when we used to go out in the field to different places and I would identify myself to somebody who it was when I was looking around, they would grab me and say, let me show you. Here's what we worked on a problem in the ED. They weren't working on the ED, but that was that team. And we changed the way we put where the person that's doing the triage so they can actually see the waiting room. What a thought that the triage person can see the person in the waiting room instead of waiting for them to slump on and fall on the floor. You know, different things like that, which made them invested that I can change anything. I am a world beater. They want me to fix problems. They want me to make things better. And then, you know, you really have changed the whole culture. But, you know, I think it's both. It's the experiential and, you know, the simulator. I think both work together. Great way to uh, conclude, Jim. Prophetic words, really. Let's, uh, I hope our <laughs> our listeners have been engaged. It's, this has really been terrific. I, I thank both of you for joining us today. We really appreciate your insights and expertise. And this brings our webinar to a close. We hope you've enjoyed today's presentation. Special thanks again to our guest host, Jim Bajan, and our guest speaker, Bridget Shaw. As a reminder, to obtain CME credits, please see the information on your screen. It's right in front of you. Scanning the QR code is an easy way to get to the link, but you can also follow the instructions on your screen. And join us for our next webinar, Reproductive Health in a post row World, Tuesday, October 25th at 12 p.m. Eastern Time. The webinar will explore the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe v. Wade and its effects on healthcare professionals. I'm also delighted to confirm a webinar at 4 p.m. on November 1st, November 1st, when we'll be discussing racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare, solutions we need. Our guest moderator will be Ron Wyatt, Vice President and Patient Safety Officer for MCIC Vermont. He'll be joined by our two special guests, Elizabeth Howell, the Harrison McCray Dixon President's Distinguished Professor and Chair of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the Perelman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania, and Lakshmi Krishnan, an internist and cultural historian of medicine at Georgetown University, where she's the founding director of the Medical Humanities Initiative. You'll see an invitation in the coming weeks for both of these events. Please share them with any colleagues who you think may be interested. And of course, look for more information about these and other events on our website, the tdcgroup.com in the insights section. We look forward to seeing and hearing from you soon. Thank you.